This is video history from the J. Bay Jacobs Library for the History of Obstetrics and Gynecology in America at the American College. It's a warm spring afternoon in the year 2002 in Los Angeles. My guest today is Dr. Richard H. Schwartz, the 41st, I think we agreed on 41st, agreed, right? <laughs> president of the college back in 1991-92. Dick, thanks very much for joining us today. My pleasure. We always like to uh, begin at the beginning, since this is really an interview of you and not an interview of the college. Uh, tell us uh, where you were born, where you grew up, uh, that sort of thing that shapes all of our lives. Right. Well, I was born in, in eastern Pennsylvania, a small town in, in the Delaware River in eastern Pennsylvania. Grew up there. Uh, my uh, father is a second generation German American. and youngest of a 15 children, <laughs> one of whom was a physician, <laughs> and I think that was the uh, initial stimulus to medicine. I uh, went to college in Easton and Lafayette College and uh, was fortunate enough uh, after three years to be admitted to Jefferson Medical College in, in Philadelphia. So I have no undergraduate degree. I'm without <laughs> a baccalaureate degree. Uh, was was uh, Lafayette a, a a uh, religious-based college, or no? Well, it had, a, it had a Presbyterian uh, background. Crown. It wasn't very apparent in the college. <laughs> and it was, at that point, an all-male college. Oh, really? Yeah, mm -hmm. as was Jefferson. When I went to Jefferson, there were no women in the mm -hmm. class there either. And uh, I was graduated from Jefferson in 1955 and went on to a resident internship first. In those days, a rotating internship before a residency in obstetrics and gynecology. Where was the internship? It was all at the old Philadelphia General oh, Hospital. That's certainly a landmark in old, American old obstetrics. Old Lockley, as it's called, <laughs> and uh, was uh, was the arguably the oldest hospital mm -hmm. in the country. There's a big debate between Philadelphia General no. and the old Pennsylvania Hospital mm -hmm. as to which one was the oldest. And your residency then was there My residency well. was also there at, at mm -hmm. uh, Philadelphia General. With some, uh, with some fine uh, people. I suppose my, my impetus to obstetrics came from my Jefferson Medical School days and people like Thaddeus Montgomery and uh, a great member of this college, the late Paul Bowers. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, mm -hmm. Who delivered my oldest, my really? oldest daughter, mm -hmm. yes. And so I think that was the, the uh, impetus for obstetrics. In fact, it was the role model uh, sort of thing that led you into the field? I think so. I think Paul, uh, in fact, I just uh, not long ago had a communication from his widow, always, and uh, had written a letter and saying that I, he was my role model, I mm -hmm. think, was the stimulus. And you then would have finished residency in, uh, what, 1959? 59, mm -hmm. and at that point I had a military obligation. I had those were the days of the doctor draft. I do it. remember it, yes. <laughs> and um, it was either go into the military right after my internship or uh, sign up with the Air Force, which I did. So I, I had a four-year obligation to the United States Air Force, <clears throat> which I uh, uh, fulfilled entirely in Biloxi, Mississippi, at Keesler Air Force <laughs> Keesler. Base, mm -hmm. following, my, uh, following my residency. And then I returned to Philadelphia uh, to spend time at the Philadelphia General Hospital full time on the University of Pennsylvania faculty. Uh, so that was my. That was another medical school. Another medical school and was my home base for uh, a number of years. Uh, half my career really was, mm -hmm. uh, was at uh, Penn and, and Philadelphia General Hospital. Yes. Well, Boston, I guess, may sometimes consider itself the cradle of American medicine. Philadelphia probably has a better claim. I, I think so, and the University of Pennsylvania, the, uh, the oldest school, medical school mm -hmm. in the country. And uh, so I, uh, I started there when the chair was uh, Franklin Payne, mm -hmm. uh, but not long thereafter, uh, Luigi Mastriani arrived. Oh. To, uh, to take the chair, so I worked with Luigi until 1978. Right now, he was, of course, primarily interested in infertility and endocrinology. Did you go in that same direction? No, I, I, 
I went in a different direction uh, in what we now call maternal fetal medicine. Uh, and uh, I was in the first group of uh, subspecialists boarded in uh, maternal fetal mm -hmm. medicine. What year was that? 1974, I believe. And, you know, uh, and of course, we were all grandfathered in in those days. I didn't have a fellowship. Um, was an interesting part of the story was, of course, that those of us who went that route were examined by some of the senior people in the field, and a few later, years later we examined and those. <laughs> same people. <laughs> those, those people who had, who had uh, admitted us. So I stayed at Penn until 1978, and then I moved to, uh, to Brooklyn to the Downstate Medical Center to become uh, chairman of obstetrics there. So what were your particular interests in uh, the entire specialty over those years? Well, maternal fetal medicine, medicine generally, but specifically infectious disease. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, always interested in, in infectious disease and in fact was one of the uh, five founding members of, of the now IDSOG, the Infectious oh, Disease Society for okay. Obstetrics and Gynecology. And so that was my uh, subset interest. And you carried that on uh, with you to New York. I did, and, uh, and most of my uh, fellows, my maternal fetal medicine fellows, uh, both at, at Penn and then uh, later on in, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, followed in that, in that interest. Are there, are there names out of that group that we likely remember? Uh, well, I, I think uh, my first fellow who, who didn't go into infectious disease <laughs> but went into maternal fetal medicine was Mike Minuti, who is now the uh, treasurer of the college, college secretary right. of the college, secretary. secretary of the college, and the chairman at, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Howard Minkoff uh, was a fellow at, uh, at Downstate, and he's probably the, I would have to say, the country's uh, leading authority on HIV. I'd disease. agree with you, yes, yeah. certainly yeah. is. And uh, another one would, would be Ron Gibbs, who was a, not a fellow, but was a resident of mm -hmm. ours at Penn. And, he picked up my interest also in, uh, in infectious disease. Mm -hmm. So those are a, a cadre of people mm -hmm. which obviously, uh, of whom I'm very proud. I, uh, so, yeah, I've, I've, I've always uh, I've thought in looking back, you see someone who is an expert in the field, like say Ron Gibbs in infectious disease, and say he's great in this, but if his mentor had been interested in uh, GYN surgery, perhaps I, I he'd be one of the country's great right. GYN oncologists. I think he'd be an oncologist, yeah. and I, but uh, you know all too well that I think uh, the greatest rewards in careers right. in academic medicine are your people. come with our offspring. Sure, yeah. sure they do. Yeah. So. You so. were there then how long? And, uh, At Downstate? State? Well, I arrived in 19, uh, 1978, and mm -hmm. um, not Long thereafter, I got sidetracked a little bit into uh, academic medicine leadership roles as uh, first the acting uh, dean and then the dean of the medical school. I think something with which you're yes. <laughs> with which you're familiar. The same kind of a play, yes. right? And I uh, I served as uh, as the dean of the medical school and chairman of obstetrics and gynecology for several years um, and until I found that it was difficult, to, uh, very difficult. Uh, to deal with both. And mm -hmm. obviously I felt that my Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology was uh, getting short shrift under those circumstances mm -hmm. because I always had to, to uh, deal with the highest uh, office. Um, I did subsequently step down and then was uh, uh, named provost, and we, provost being the senior academic officer mm -hmm. for, the, for the whole uh, campus. Uh, and I stayed there uh, in those roles until 1993, when actually I served as president uh, of the uh, medical center for a year. Uh, after that, I, I was on the, uh, when I stepped down, I was on the faculty in the obstetrics and gynecology uh, for, I guess, three more years, and then I retired from the state system. But not retired. But couldn't figure out a way to stop working. Right. So I, uh, since 1996, I've been uh, chairman of the Department of Obstetrics uh, and Gynecology at New York Methodist Hospital, mm -hmm. 
that hospital is a part of the Cornell Columbia network, so my academic uh, position is now at Cornell, mm -hmm. a professor at Cornell. Uh, in in all of this uh, this time, in which you're doing the administrative work, what were your particular interests in health uh, and as it reflected in obstetrics and gynecology? Uh, well, I, I uh, clearly got involved uh, both uh, through the administrative positions at Downstate and actually during my uh, presidency of the college uh, with. Uh, Basically, healthcare economics and healthcare for underserved women, and this was a big problem for us in uh, at Downstate, where we had the Kings County Hospital across the street, mm -hmm. one of the largest uh, uh, county hospitals on the East Coast, with a large population of uh, underserved women. Uh, I think I uh, I served as the college's first chair of a committee for <laughs> underserved uh, underserved women. I believe appointed by Bill Mixon when he was uh, president. I think mm -hmm. we created, he created that committee which had mm -hmm. been uh, there before. So uh, along the way, um, Philadelphia General Hospital, Kings County Hospital, mm -hmm. so the care of uh, the medically indigent mm -hmm. has been a great concern for me over, over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, as I think I mentioned to you earlier, I. In my presidential <laughs> address, I talked about the fact that there were large numbers of uninsured women in this country and uninsured children, and um, sad to say that hasn't that hasn't yet been resolved. Yeah. Uh, some ten years later, in the uh, in the course of this career, uh, what was your, if you'll pardon the expression, political career within the college? How did you how did you rise to become? Uh, president uh, through the ranks of the college? Well, I, I had a, a dual approach, actually, because uh, while I was still in Philadelphia, I did get actively involved in the college there and uh, was chair of the Pennsylvania section and uh, was rising through the, the ranks of the uh, district officership when, uh, when I moved to New York, but very quickly got into the mm -hmm. District 2. Mm -hmm. Uh, activities. Sort of simultaneously, I was a green jacket. I, I was on the program committee and ultimately uh, chaired the program committee and was general chair for, I think, a meeting in Dallas, as I, as I recall, so that uh, I guess I partook of both. 7075, I yeah, think that was. Yeah, I think that was the year I chaired mm -hmm. the uh, it was general chair for the program, so maybe in '76. But anyway, <laughs> those <laughs> are but those are I, I two I guess of the common yeah. pathways to uh, to leadership mm -hmm. positions uh, in the college, and I served as vice president. Uh, yeah, you yeah, you yeah. were vice president then before before being president. Not not a necessary not a necessary uh, step. step doesn't right. always come right. that way, right? right. Yeah. What were what were your particular uh, initiatives as president? What were the things you saw as important or would like to Accomplish well. I, I think, uh, uh, in fact, it was it was one that uh, we worked on and, and unfortunately didn't come to pass. We were hoping, uh, and you may recall that uh, there was a physician by the name of Reed Tuxen who had been the uh, yes. mm -hmm. uh, commissioner of health. I think. Yes, in, Reed in is Reed is still very much in evidence today. He, he yes. is indeed, yes. and a good friend. <laughs> Yeah. And he and I had uh, worked very hard on a project which we just couldn't get through the uh, political machinery of the District of Columbia. We yes. wanted to start a, a, uh, a project uh, there for some of the underserved uh, women mm -hmm. in, the, in the district, and we just never managed to get by that, uh, uh, that political scene uh, there. And of course, it was al also at the time of uh, just as uh, Clinton was coming into office and there was the whole health care reform uh, thing that never quite, never never quite, quite made, made it, it no. but we were, I was very much involved uh, in that and uh, uh, as was the college altogether. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and again, the concerns were those concerns, particularly about the economics and, and particularly about health care for, for the poor and underserved women. Has that that last interest, the one poor and underserved women, carried over into the work that you're doing now at uh, the Methodist Hospital? Well, I have, I have um, 
stayed involved in, in, in several ways. Uh, over the years, I, I served uh, for some time as uh, chair of the Obstetrical Advisory Committee to the Commissioner of Health in the City of New York. And then I had a long time association with the March of Dimes. And, uh, Serve. Yeah, everybody's going to say that you know that's been a very important association for the specialty and for women. And, and when you when you get a moment, comment on that. Yeah, too. I will because I think um, I started out uh, when I shortly after I got to Downstate uh, and was uh, asked to join the medical advisory committee for the Greater New York chapter of the mm -hmm. March of Dimes by a good friend that you'll know, uh, Mort Schiffer, who had yes. been very much involved. Mm -hmm. And so I served on that. Um, and that body for a time. And then subsequent to that, the, um, the person who was the executive director for the Greater New York chapter was one Jennifer House, yes. now the president no. of, uh, of the right. National right. Organization right. of the Foundation. And so ultimately I became involved with the, uh, with the National Organization uh, as an obstetrical consultant. They had a particular pension for having their full-time doctors all be pediatricians. So yes, I that, they, was, uh, <laughs> that was always the way with the March of Dimes. They, of course, that's where it began, uh, I guess. It, we have indeed to it did. Let them and, have and that. So I served as obstetrical consultant mm -hmm. for, for several years through the uh, folic acid campaign. In fact, I still uh, work as consultant to the National Foundation. And, and uh, I've tried, as you and I both know, to keep the association with the college a close mm -hmm. one. and. Uh, I believe that the college will be partnering with the foundation in their new initiative on prematurity. That's the good, the, the coming uh, initiative for the foundation, and uh, you know, we've been we've been working actively with the college on mm -hmm. on that uh, on that issue. Yeah, the um, uh, move then uh, that that. You know, it's one thing that you've accomplished since the time you've been president and working in New York Methodist. Other things besides the uh, March of Dimes liaison? Well, um, I, I think that um, I have to say that the move to Methodist after, uh, after retiring from, um, uh, from downstate <laughs> and from the, you know, the administrative positions at the mm -hmm. medical school uh, was uh, a return to uh, something that I very much enjoyed and, and you'll be able to appreciate because uh, I was able to get back to teaching it's residents and medical students mm -hmm. and uh, probably doing something that I knew how to do <laughs> better than I knew how to be a dean. Uh, uh, most of us, I guess, in, in our uh, era who have served as medical school deans uh, didn't have any special training courses for that. We, right. we came from, <laughs> from clinical disciplines <laughs> and, uh, and just uh, mm -hmm. Uh, came into those jobs and had to learn a lot about administration and, and, and finance and so you forth. You learned to duck when being shot at, yes. That's <laughs> right, you learned to duck and, and uh, you learned to try to figure out how in the world to, uh, uh, to budget the activities of uh, medical school, which I must say, I, I enjoyed my time there, but I'm relieved to not have to try to figure that out anymore because I think it's increasingly mm -hmm. difficult to, uh, to do, particularly a school like uh, Downstate, which is of course an inner city uh, school and, and dependent on finance from both the city of New York and the state mm -hmm. of New York and uh, uh, trying to create a budget out of that is, uh, is quite a how, how is the Methodist Hospital supported? Uh, well, it's a private hospital. Uh, while we do have about 30% uh, of our clinical population uh, are Medicaid or Medicare supported, uh, our obstetrics is about 30% Medicaid. Uh, but has been very fortunate to have a good location, a good administrator, and probably mm -hmm. one of few hospitals in the metropolitan area that's uh, <laughs> not in the red these days. So uh, that's been a pleasure, and I haven't had to worry about that part of it. Uh, I've only, my, my real task, and uh, as from most uh, hospital administrators these days, is how can you grow the, uh, the service? And we've done that uh, primarily by building a new, a new facility with uh, patient-friendly uh, labor delivery recovery rooms mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And so our, our uh, obstetrics has grown from about 3,200 deliveries a year when I got there to about 4,200 now. So we're, we're, that makes the administration very happy. Tell us about your family. I haven't uh, given you much of a chance well, to do that. Well, right. Uh, I, uh, 
of course, you know my, my wife, Patty, and who's been with me through all this mm -hmm. college career and, and uh, has been uh, a great part of my success. And I have uh, four children, uh, uh, three daughters and, and a son. They all grew up in the Philadelphia area, and uh, two of the daughters now uh, live out in Ohio. Uh, and my oldest daughter and my son both live in the in the Philadelphia uh, suburban uh, area, and we've got five grandchildren. Uh, interestingly, none of my children are in medicine uh, or health in any way, or not even remotely. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I I always suggest that maybe that's because um, uh, they they found a lot of Christmas mornings that Daddy was yes, off delivering a baby or something, and. Uh, <laughs> They, uh, but uh, the girls um, uh, are, uh, uh, two of them are teachers and the other one's uh, a paralegal. And, and my son um, has his own business and his specialty is building race car engines, uh, which <laughs> I don't, still I a don't good know business, where I that imagine. came from, but uh, he's very good at it in any case. And, uh, uh, and, and builds these fancy engines for people, for I guess people who uh, race uh, professionally, mm -hmm. race their cars. Stock car uh, racing. No, this thing? is no. this is okay. no. It's a little different. This is uh, uh, these are mostly Porsches, and I understand mm -hmm. that a lot of these folks who race those cars are uh, are pretty wealthy people, and this is kind of start a, rich, a, yeah. a sport uh, for the wealthy uh. auto <laughs> auto owners. Right. Well, back to back to your career. You know, over over all of these. Uh, years, what have you felt best about as your contributions to uh, the college and to the specialty in general? Well, well let me say first of all that uh, the, the honor and privilege of, of uh, serving as president of the college was, was clearly a highlight of, uh, uh, of, my, of my career. Let me and say that it was earned as well. Well, but, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless a yeah. highlight and uh, I, it's something that uh, uh, you may remember uh, that during my presidential year, both at the year of the meeting for my inauguration as president and then at the presidential meeting, I was able to bring my father and, uh, and uh, how much he uh, enjoyed that and, and the pride that he had. Um, and I, I think that um, hopefully one of the things that uh, I was uh, able to do and, and I think that uh, I've always been concerned that academic obstetricians and gynecologists need to be involved with this organization. Not all of them are. Not all are. Not all of them are. Uh, and um, I, I hope that I've, I've sort of encouraged uh, my colleagues in academics to be involved with the college. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, obviously the things, however, that about my career of which I'm proudest uh, remain those young people whose careers I helped mm -hmm. to influence and uh, mold. Those are the, those are the great the rewards. And finally, the reward of being able to travel the country and travel the world on behalf of the college and, and meet a lot of great people, mm -hmm. uh, people who we've, I would never have met uh, mm -hmm. if it weren't for the college. And uh, that's both uh, here in the States and, and internationally. So even today I see you wearing a tie from the Royal College <laughs> yes, of indeed. Obstetricians and something, Gynecologists. <laughs> right, something I'm uh, proud of, and I know you're uh, uh, also a fellow adiandum of the college, and I, uh, I'm very proud of that and uh, that association. I have some very, very good friends uh, in the UK uh, as a result of this. Well, Richard, it's uh, been a great and good career uh, that you've had, and I think all of us have to be glad that uh, your expertise crossed over into the college and helped the college do better as well. Uh, Warren, we thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you for being a part of us. Thank you very much. Thank you.